You've played Dota 2 for thousands of hours, but you've always wanted something more. A reason to fight, a deeper meaning to your battles. But to know the hidden history of Dota 2, you must go on an adventure of a lifetime. An adventure into the law! Although the universe of Dota has many tall tales and is filled with seemingly unlimited unknowns, one thing that all men, God, and other seem to know of are the Ancients. While their war is known and ongoing, their story is shrouded in mystery and intrigue. The history of the Ancients is a long and complicated story, one that we will only touch on briefly. Before time and before anything, there was a presence in the empty void of what would one day be called the universe. Nothing is known of this primordial mind except for its limitless power. When the universe big banged into existence, the explosion was large enough to shatter this roaming consciousness into several fragments. Two of those fragments became the Radiant and the Dire. Radenthal and Dyrolth? Oh god. Two opposite personalities of the self, the primordial cosmic being. Radiant being focused on creation, tranquility, and intelligence, with Dyer being focused on violence, anger, and strength. Rather than acknowledge that they were once one and the same, the two decided that they would rather be independent beings and set out to destroy their polar opposites. A third personality, Zet, who remained loyal to the original mind and wished to reunite the self, went to work to stop these two and reunite them. Headcanon alert! Oh, excuse me, that is the headcanon alert. When you're talking lore with me, there are two types. There's canon lore, meaning that everything I'm talking about is a fact. There's irrefutable evidence, you can look it up. And the other one is headcanon, where uh, it's never explicitly stated that it's a fact, but in my opinion, if you connect the dots, read between the lines, it makes sense in the context of the lore. Basically, headcanon means that it makes enough sense to be the lore for me, personally, in my head, but that's anyhow. Headcanon alert! The primordial mind was much like a human mind, each lobe and hemisphere designed with performing a certain task. The explosion ripped the mind apart, leaving these hemispheres, or lobes, by themselves. In the human brain, the left hemisphere of the brain controls logic, science, mathematics, while the right controls creativity, change, and action. Radiant and dire. Zet then would represent the corpus callosum, the band of nerves in between the two hemispheres, which acts as an intermediary of information between the two hemispheres and physically keeps them together. Uh, for now, we only know two parts of the self and Zet. In the future, we could find other parts of the Zet in our hemispheres, could actually be split into lobes, each with their own personalities, but for now, two hemispheres and the corpus callosum. Uh, that makes sense to me. It cannon's over. During their bickering and battles, Zet, in one swift move, imprisoned these two entities into a prison made of stone, trapping them in a large moon he had created and flung them into the orbit of a very unremarkable planet. And there they sat for aeons. However, the Ark Warden overlooked one simple fact. The only way two corporal beings that only exist as a consciousness could possibly wage war would be to corrupt the physical world around them and implant themselves, much like a parasitic virus, into anything in the physical area. With only the stones of the moon to work with, the two transferred themselves into the rocks of the moon, becoming ore within and clashing to dominate more and more of the limited space around them. Eventually, these battles cracked the moon and shattered it completely, plummeting it to the now extremely fertile planet below. Still trapped in their physical prison of the rocks from the mad moon, these two entities could not escape but could force their will and characteristics upon those who were close enough to their physical form. And the people of the planet did indeed want to be close due to the ore of the moon having you know, crazy magical properties, which, uh, you know, 
are highly sought after. Eventually, the moon rocks were so coveted, villages were created around them. Little did these people know that the strange ores were actually cosmic beings who were slowly corrupting them and changing them mentally and physically to adopt their characteristic and will, turning them into creeps. Creeps who, headcanon alert, seem to be able to live pretty normal lives uh, unless confronted with somebody under the influence of the other personality uh, who they will attack on sight until the enemy dies or they die. AKA uh, explaining creep aggro and how that works in the game. Anywho, eventually the battles of those corrupted by the ancients turned into a full-blown war, attracting heroes, gods, and everything in between into the conflict, brainwashing those heroes to fight on whatever side they were physically nearest to. That's why an evil guy might be fighting for the Radiant, or a lovely maiden might be fighting for the Dire. Heroes are simply puppets controlled to fight for these roaming minds. You see, you, the player, you are the ancient. You are the mind behind the heroes, forcing them to do your bidding and using their skills to fight to kill your rival sibling. That is why the game ends when the ancient dies, because that is when you, the player, die, and your control over the hero disappears. That's yeah, pretty neat, huh? So that, in short, is the story of the Ancients. A very quick refresher, the Ancients are conscious personalities, physically trapped in rock and ore, which infect and corrupt the planet and creatures that are near them, both physically and mentally, to carry out their bidding. They're both evil, they both hate each other, and they both have unique characteristics and colors. Colors! Right, that, that was in the title of the video, huh? We're gonna talk about color. Now in our universe, color is just how we interpret the light spectrum and whatever. But in Dota, color means more. Every color represents something in the Dota 2 universe. Let's start easy. The Radiant is blue. You can see the influence of blue all around the landscape of the Radiant and its effects. Now, headcanon alert! The Radiant amuses itself with intelligent design, embracing and controlling both creatures and plants around it, while Dyer shows its strength by ripping up the land and reforming it in its image. Radiant amuses itself with controlling the existing landscape and bending it to its will. This can be seen with the weird blue runes present on all of the Radiant nature-themed heroes. As you can see, these stones have a blue Radiant ore in them, but they are tied to the heroes, almost uh, like brands or shackles, adding weight and holding them down. In the end, Radiant enslaves and Dyer destroys. Uh, can it over? So in the end, Radiant Blue represents its intelligence, its ability to control, manipulate, and enslave. Dyer, on the other hand, is represented with red, which represents its strength as it tears up the land to suit its image, and its unstoppable brute, well, strength. Headcanon alert! This is also why one of the most physically strong races in Dota, the Oglogi, are naturally red, as they were one of the first people to live near the Dire Ancient and use its ore in their weapons, thus changing them physically to match the Dire's influence of red strength. Only a few scholarly Oglogi who don't use Dire ore uh, lose this red skin tone and go back to their natural tan color. Whoa, 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 whoa! Intelligence and strength! Yep, those are attributes to our heroes and the fundamentals of what characterizes life on this planet. So yes, blue represents intelligence, meaning radiant, and red represents strength, meaning dire. These color representations are everywhere, from heroes' physical forms to items in the game, so let's talk about items. Now the ore from the ancients was coveted because they hold certain uh, mystical traits. Red or black dire stone is heavy, blunt, and gives the uh, user increased strength and aggression, whereas the blue radiant ore can uh, boost intelligence, but is also pliable enough to be used in fabrics and cloth. However, despite adding to the intelligence of the wearer, the blue radiant clothing always has a habit of controlling and corrupting whoever wears it. My favorite example of this is the magic stick, which is literally just a stick someone found on the ground wrapped in some radiant blue cloth, and it made it magical. Hilarious. Alright, alright, but what about other colors? Well, purple is a fun one. It uh, represents the unknown. A weird definition, but hear me out. Knowledge is the most powerful thing in the Dota universe. All creatures have the ability to use skills and magic innately. 
but it is only their intelligence that holds them back. The amount of knowledge and experience you gain in your life can literally ascend you to godlike states. And this is represented by the level up system. The more you learn in Dota, the stronger you physically and mentally get in the Dota universe. And doing something as simple as reading a tome of knowledge can increase your power exponentially. So in a universe where experience and knowledge can make you a literal god, what would be more desired than the unknown? The unknown is the most coveted thing in the universe because it can directly give you power with that knowledge. So yeah, the unknown is actually a pretty big deal. Anyhow, Purple. Templar Assassin joins an order to protect the unknown, but also learn its secrets, turning her purple. Darkseer is from an unknown dimension, which has secrets beyond our own purple. Arkwarden is born directly from the primordial land of the self, which, and get an alert, might be the Shadow Realm, which Dazzle entered and returned purple. Realm of the Unknowns of Time opens up a portal to another dimension. Ah, uh, you're not buying it? All right, let's talk items. Invisible items are purple to represent the unknown. Smoke makes you undetectable by wards and your location unknown, and dust reveals the unknown. Neat, right? Oh, oh wait a second, what's that? Ah, yes! Gold! Gold represents the planet and normal creatures that roam the planet that the ancients crash into. Gold has always been historically coveted by humans from BC to 2017, so it makes sense that gold would represent the color of the planet. By the way, the planet that the ancients crashed to has uh, no name in its lore, and it's gonna be annoying as hell for me to skirt around that issue, so from now on, I'm gonna call it in this video, Rue, after my dog, Rexy Wrinkles Rue. So gold represents things created from Rue itself with no influence from the ancients, and you can see that in gold items either don't have any magical properties or are seemingly experiments by the people of Rue to infuse the ancients' power with their own technology. And, uh, you know, we use those metals to create useful things. A gold pouch with purple dust. Normal people's weapons to try to discover the unknown. A gold ring with dire ore. A ring created to gain strength and health. A gold ring with red and blue and purple in the background. A, a human ring made with dire ore, which reduces strength to boost concentration, i.e. intelligence, and pierce the unknown. You see what I'm going with this. This shit isn't just random. So yes, gold equals rue the planet of the ancients crash to and the people that try to live and use this ancient power. Colors. But something has been missing hasn't it? You have the feeling that we've forgotten something in all this intelligence, strength, and uh, something else. But to find the answer to that feeling that something is wrong, we need to travel all the way to the outer rim of the universe and meet with our friend, the Outworld Devourer. First, let's take a look at Outworld Devourer physically. He is a centurion, which is to say he has four legs and two arms, but this is pretty special in the universe of Dota 2. Sure, centaurs are pretty common, but the body type is also unique to beings that I like to call guardians. Guardians are creatures born to both represent and protect the different aspects of their planet. On Rue, we have two guardians, uh, Enchantress, who represents all that is good in nature, its kindness, its giving, its creation and life. And we also have Lashrak, who represents the disorder of nature, the lightning, the earthquakes, the chaos, scary stuff. Both these beings are born from the planet and both serve to represent and protect it in their own special way. So in theory then, every planet should have these guardians. So now we look to Outworld. Four legs, two arms, a staff, and alien wings. Okay, but he appears to be a guardian all the same. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. What about Bane? He looks like that too. Well, Bane is the manifestation of a god's nightmares, a god who watches over a planet. What else would a god dream about but the corruption and damnation of the only thing that they have to care about, the planet under their care? By time. Whoa, did I blow your mind there? Well, keep up. Oh, right, him? I forgot about him. I'm, I'm saving him for later. Don't worry, it'll pay off. So Outworld is, or more accurately, was a guardian of the planet. But let's go ahead and uh, take a look at his lore. All right, here we go. One of a lordly and magistral race, okay, the guardians, 
Harborer prowls the edge of the void, sole surviving sentry of an outpost on the world at the rim of the abyss. Okay, so he's the last survivor of his planet, a planet that he himself was the guardian of and the protector of, all right. From this jagged crystalline outworld, forever on guard, he has gazed for eternities into the heavens, alert for any stirring in the bottomless night of the stars. So he's looking for something and is very invested in finding it, obviously the thing that destroyed his planet. Uh, imprint of blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is a fancy is saying that the thing that he destroyed his world has a pattern, one that's recognizable and one that he has seen before. Beyond the edges of creation, oh, I know three things that are beyond the edge of creation, and turned its attention to our world, the world the ancients are on, reminder. With his whole being focused on his vigil, Outworld Devourer played little attention to the events closer into the sun. So he was so focused on finding the thing that he didn't think to look at some shitty little Earth-like planet near the sun. But he was probably on a huge planet somewhere out there, as planets tend to get bigger as they are further away from the sun. But as the last clamor of the ancients and a sense of growing threat from it within, as well as without, sent him winging sunward to visit the plains of war. Our prisoner's place, of his own prophecy, blah, 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 blah. And there we go. Alright, so cool info, but well, what was the point? The point, dear friends, is colors. And colors tell us exactly what killed Outworld's planet. Let's take a look at him again, shall we? Uh, you can tell that the Guardian body structure, but uh, what's with the stones? If you look closely, you can see that the stone is not part of his original body. In fact, according to his death lines, the stone reaches my heart, I fall like a stone, the stone is killing him, spreading on him like a virus, and eventually it will consume him. Wait a second, a rock that behaves like a virus? Where have I seen this before? Ah, the ancients. How is this possible? Well, no one ever said that this was the first time the ancients were trapped in a moon. This just might be a recurring cycle, where Zet completes his mission, defeats the ancients, putting them into a moon as ore, and then shoots them out into space. I mean, when you think about it, if you have two immortal beings, what else do you do except for fling them into space and imprison them for as long as you possibly can? Gravity is a thing, though. When you throw something out into space, it's eventually gonna orbit something. In the case of the ancients, the power of the planet that they orbit can give them enough kinetic energy to absorb and use, corrupt, escape their mad moon. So this has happened before. The ancients have fell to a planet, their stones corrupting all the life on it, eventually Zet imprisoning them yet again, and Outworld shows us the end result of the ancients' war, the full corruption of a planet by the ancients. Now he's a high intelligence hero, he has a massive radiant influence, but he's not blue. No, he's, he's green. Green. Not nature green, not a leafy green, but this weird light neon green, this bluish green. What colors make green? Anyway, blue, the radiant, and yellow. A planet. But Outworld's stones are very dire. He looks just like a dire tower. So he's radiance magic with dire strength and a planet infused it all. They make something new entirely. They make green. So green is the color of something new. Great, we know green. Uh, green is agility, right? But what is agility? In a sense, it's power. It's your attack speed, your damage, your ability only to kill. Not cast spells, which can heal or hurt. Not grow in strength, which can show just how healthy you are. But green only has one purpose. To kill. Green is the end result of the ancient's war on a planet. Something neither of them expect to create. A child of their own destruction. Blue plus yellow equals green. What destroys the planet of Outworld was the ancients, yes, but it is what they created that completely ended it, corrupted it fully, making them both weak enough to be defeated by Zet and imprison them again. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the third ancient, the Nether. Something is growing on Rue, under the crust of the planet. You can see the Radiant and the Dire both seem to corrupt downward on the map, influence changing the planet itself. We know that the Radiant's intelligent design shaping properties, but we also see how it changes the world around it, under the surface, the nether reaches. We have three creatures from the underground in the game, Pugna, Viper, and Underlord. All three have that very familiar green light hue. All three are masters in weird destructive magic, and all three are dire-looking and highly aggressive. 
These are the trademarks of the Nether, the third ancient. Ru, as a planet, is corrupted, changing. The blue magic of the radiance seeps into the rocks below, combining with the yellow of the earth to create green, a place which is extremely potent in magic and intelligence, but is driven and corrupted by the power of Dyer's influence. The nether reaches give incredible intelligence and power to those it corrupts, changing mere cave snakes into highly intelligent creatures that can talk, plan, and use magic, changing children into powerful wizards. Hell, the world under the world even has its own guardian. The third ancient grows as the clash between the ancients continue, eventually becoming strong enough to wage its own war on the surface, weakening the ancients enough to kill them or weaken them enough to be imprisoned yet again. The third ancient will eventually destroy this planet, leaving no one or maybe just one survivor behind. Where Dire and Radiant fight, the nether consumes, the nether kills. The Bastard Child of the Conflict. Thanks for watching this lore theory. I plan to do a few more in the future. Uh, Dota lore is pretty fun for me. And I would love your suggestions, ideas, but especially would love your criticisms of what you thought I got wrong in this movie in the comments. So we could have a really embarrassing nerd lore fight. I love those. Also, I almost have 100,000 subs, and when I get that, YouTube sends me a cool little plaque. So if you want to throw me a sub, even though you don't sub to anybody else, because who subs on YouTube? Who cares? That's eh, no big deal, but uh, if you do it, I get a little present, so that'd be nice. Anyway, thank you for watching. We'll have some more lore coming out soon, and I hope this blew your mind in some way. Uh, keep having fun in Dota, and keep your eyes to the lore.